The message series for this, uh, for really the last two months, has been superheroes. The idea behind the message series is we can discover in the Bible heroes of faith that lead us to discover there is a power we're meant to have. We're meant to be people who live superhero lives of faith, patterning our lives after those we find in the scriptures who connect to God and lead us to that same eternal faith connection. Over the course of this message series, many of you have mentioned to me superhero stories. I heard one just today. I want to share with you. So there's one of you who, who is a babysitter, takes care of one of the, a nanny takes care of a two-year-old. The two-year-old walks into the room and says to her nanny with a cape around her neck, I am a superhero. You are? Are you Wonder Woman? No. Are you Batgirl? No. A couple other superhero names get thrown out. And then the nanny says, well, what are you? And she says... I'm commercial. <laughs> well, that's, first of all, I mean, certainly commercials influence our lives more than anything I can imagine sometimes, but, I mean, is that every parent's dream? That their little, little two-year-old will say, I am commercial. Oh, maybe we need to raise the standards of what a superhero is a little bit more. The scriptures call us to an eternal faith that leads us to an eternal life that begins now. And as we live that life, we discover who we're meant to be. So this morning, as we talk together about where we're going, I hope that you'll have in mind the possibility there might be something for you that you want to follow along with, that you might want to uh, uh, write down for yourself. There are ways you can do that. I hope you'll be uh, engaging in this message time for yourself. Feel free to email me a story about... uh, superhero moment in your life. Stop me before or after church today or next week and, and just share with me what's going on. I want to suggest to you, though, that today there's something for each of us in this scripture that we read. Even though this is an ancient scripture, I really believe it's a scripture that calls us to a very real and living faith. Before I get to the message scripture and to some of the other ideas, I want to go back to our Bible theme that's generating the momentum, the direction stands as a core for the entire message series. In the New Testament book of Acts, Jesus says to his disciples, and he speaks to us and says to us as well, something that stands at the very foundation of what it means to be a creation of God. When Jesus says to us, But you are to be given power when the Holy Spirit has come to you. You're to be given power when the Holy Spirit has come to you. Now, what does this power do for us? Does it allow us to become extraordinarily rich immediately? No, not necessarily. Does it take away from us all the troubles we've ever experienced in life? Absolutely not. In fact, when Jesus says to his first disciples, you're going to receive power from the Holy Spirit, and what are you supposed to do with it? Then you're supposed to go to every corner of the world and and stand before the world and testify to who God is and how God has raised the one who's speaking, Jesus, from death. And that this, this resurrection power leads to an eternal life that changes today and tomorrow. It doesn't make us... Uh, perfect immediately, doesn't completely change our imperfections, but rather leads us to discover who we're meant to be, creations of God filled with power from the Holy Spirit. It was a threat, actually, to receive this power because it meant that the first disciples would go out into the world and risk their lives for the message and the witness and the ministry of Jesus Christ. And every one of those first disciples willingly went into all four corners of the world, the known world at the time, starting churches, building up disciples in Jesus Christ, sharing the love of Christ and the message and story of Jesus Christ, his life, death, and resurrection. And they became examples for you and me to help us understand we are created to be filled with power. That power should shape us and make us into the people we're meant to be over time. It also calls us together to be part of a living faith and communities of faith like this church. So this morning, you and I are called to realize we are created to be people who are filled with the Spirit of God, and that brings to us a kind of power that changes us for the better. The scripture for this morning speaks about two women who are looking to discover from their king, their wise king, a solution to their problem. The background to this story is that this is a image of the people of Israel in the earliest days of the, 
of the kingdom of Israel. There have been two kings before the one who is being spoken to in that scripture. King Saul was the first king of Israel, King David the second. Then King David had a, well, he had a few sons, but his third son, King Solomon, is the one who we see here before us. And Solomon is someone who is trusted by the people to act in a way that brings to them a kind of strength and a kind of direction they can't find on their own. The reason for this meeting in the scripture is because something has happened that has really confused the, the women who are approaching this king, and they don't know what to do. And at least the first idea for this morning that I think is always true for us, and that as we begin talking together, I think this is crucial for us. There is a certainty in life, and it is this, that life throws us curveballs. It's just part of life. Now, you know, I, I love baseball. One of you went to see, a, I grew up in Kansas City, one of you went to see a Royals game recently and mentioned to me you saw the Cardinals beat the Royals. You seem to find a lot of glee in, <laughs> in that. There have been a lot of losses this year for my Royals, but fortunately I've been converted to the Cardinal way. So, um, you know, the idea behind a curveball is this. In, in baseball or softball, the majority of pitches thrown to a batter, to a hitter, are fastballs. They come at a certain speed. There's a kind of predictability to it. There's a kind of expected um, path that the ball takes. And so the hitter times when to swing and when, where to put the, the bat in order to make contact with the ball. I mean, it is a difficult thing, this sport, hitting a round ball with a round bat. It's a strange kind of thing to think about. What does a curveball do? A curveball throws a batter's timing off. It slows down what's happening. It changes the direction of the ball. It becomes unpredictable. And it's meant to uh, defeat the hitter. One of the best curveball pitchers that's lived in the 21st century is this guy right here, our own Adam Wainwright. And back in 2006, when we were facing the New York Mets, who when I was growing up, we used to call them pond scum. I don't know if you all still remember that, those days. But back in 2006, there was this time where it was the ninth inning, and there were two batters, two, two runners on base. It was a crucial seventh game, and, and up to bat was the, one of the, the historically best clutch hitters in the playoffs, Carlos Beltran, who later became a Cardinal, by the way. But Adam Wainwright in 2006 was just this young kid who had taken over the responsibility of being the, the, the closer, the pitcher who came in at the end of the, to save the game because our closer wasn't able to take on those responsibilities. And so this young guy at the time, just a kid, is thrown into this pressure situation. He's got two strikes on uh, Carlos Beltran, the like I said, I mean, a crucial, a crucial, a great clutch hitter who I think had hit three home runs in this series. He comes through in this moment that we're about to watch, and Carlos Beltran defeats Adam Wainwright, and there's two strikes on him. He's expecting a fastball out and away, a, a, a ball to try and get him to reach for it. So here's what happens in that uh, classic moment with Adam Wainwright. I don't know if you can really tell, that was a curveball. And, and, and what happens is Carlos Beltran froze. And he did nothing. Now, before that scene, the camera, and you didn't hear any sound, but the, they're talking about how great Carlos Beltran is. And you could see these images of Mets fans, because they're in New York. And they're like this. They're like this. They're like tears, you know, they're, so, they're standing up yelling. They're like, finally, we're going to win again. And then... The unthinkable happens. The hero of heroes for the Mets just stands there and watches, frozen by the curveball. You know, for us, each of us goes through times where life throws us a curveball and we're frozen. We don't know what to do. Second idea is this, that sometimes big mistakes can be made when stress and anxiety dominate decision making. What happens when we have a curveball thrown our way? We are filled with stress, anxiety, it's tough to make a good decision. I can't tell you, but I bet Mr. Beltran can tell us how many times he's asked, even today, why didn't you swing? 
that curveball was 77 miles an hour. The fastball that he was seeing was about 92, so it's much slower, and it dropped right over the middle of the plate. Why didn't you swing? Sometimes when we are filled with stress and anxiety, our decision-making brain just short circuits, and we make bad decisions. You know, I think one of the greatest challenges in life is a fairly everyday kind of decision for us living in the 21st century, especially out here in the suburbs of St. Louis. You know, it's crucial to have a car. Don't you know, right? It's crucial to have a car to be able to get from place to place. Have you ever made a bad decision about a car because you felt stressed? You weren't sure what the right kind of car was. You didn't know how much you could afford. You were worried, you know, Right now, I have to buy this car, some kind of car, and I don't know what to do. And so maybe you're like me, and you look for value. You look for something that's going to get you the most, the most car for your money, even though you can't afford much. And so you, maybe you've done what I've done before, and that is you've reached out and taken a risk and bought a car. You thought, well, this is probably going to have everything I need, even though I won't spend a lot of money on it. Have you ever bought a car like this? Do you remember those old Pintos? <laughs> Do you ever buy a bomb like that and you think, oh, this is gonna be okay. But really, you should have put a sign on the back of it that said, stay back, because this thing, will, <laughs> it'll blow any time. Haven't you felt the stress from buying? Now, some of you are as at ease about buying a car as most of us are about breathing. But for the majority of us, cars, automobiles, bring stress to life. They do, they just fill us with stress. And they're really an example, of a metaphor for the challenges we face in life when we experience the stress, the anxiety of that, those significant curveballs. We usually compound the problem. You know, when we have to get a car and we think, I'm just gonna get something, I know it's gonna help me, and then we make it worse. It happens in life. The scripture for this morning speaks about two women who have have not lived the wisest lives and they get to a crucial moment and they make some mistakes and they compound the problem and make it worse. And so they look for a king to offer to them some solution to their problem, which was the custom of their day. Third idea is, is this, that it is good to find wise counsel to help with life's curveballs. So we know it's going to happen. Things are going to happen to us that just confuse us, frustrate us. Difficult situations where we don't see any way out. What should we do? We should find people who we can trust, who can be wise for us and leave, lead us through those challenges. I mean, find someone who we can spend time in prayer with who we can say, hey, I need your help. I can tell you, when we face some of the challenges of life, some of those curveballs come our way, what I've discovered is what we end up doing is, is not seeking counsel, but, but retreating. And that doesn't help. That doesn't get us in the right direction. You know, there, there is, I think, a certain necessary humility to Christian faith, where we admit we don't know everything, we all make mistakes, we all get frustrated by life, and we don't control a lot of our own life because life brings to us circumstances, or we put ourselves in places where then we are facing challenges. And so in order for us to really recognize where we need to go, we need to look for someone wise, someone to lead us in the right direction. That leads us to the fourth idea, which is this, that today's super is the wise king who reveals to us God's wisdom for a righteous life. A wise king. How did this guy, Solomon, get so wise? How'd that happen? The scripture speaks to us about who this wise king is. It says this, when he realized that he was going to be the next king of Israel, he prayed to God and said, God, here's what I want. Give me a God-listening heart so I can lead your people well, discerning the difference between good and evil. For who on their own is capable of leading your glorious people? This was King Solomon's way of saying, God, I don't know how to do this job you're gonna, I'm being called to do. I'm being anointed to do. And so give to me the one thing that will help me to be the best king, help me to be wise, to discern good from evil. 
The scripture goes on to say, we don't have it here, but the scripture goes on to say that because of Solomon's willingness to ask for something that wouldn't benefit him, he ended up benefiting from this wisdom. He lived in a way that benefited him in ways people could see. A wise king is what he wished to be. And the scripture really builds on this theme that he is wise and he's discerning and he helps the people to understand the direction God wants them to go into. And so that leads us to the scripture for today where there are two women who had two children, two babies, and one baby dies and then they're fighting over the baby whose it is. And they go to the king to say, help us to resolve this dispute. And what does the king say to them? He, He says to them, the king says, what are we to do? The woman says, this woman says, the living son is mine, and the dead one's yours. And this woman says, no, the dead one's yours, and the living one's mine. After a moment, the king said, bring me a sword. So they brought a sword to the king. And then he said, cut the living baby in two, give half to one and half to the other. What happens then? Then the real mother of the living baby was overcome with emotion for her son and said, oh no, master, give her the whole baby alive. Don't kill him. But the other one said, if I can't have him, you can't have him. Cut away. The king gave gave his decision. Give the living baby to the first woman. Nobody's going to kill this baby. She is the real mother. We use this analogy at different times. Uh, I hear this every once in a while uh, um, alluded to in our, in our common culture about you know, cutting a baby in half, and it's used in a way that's really disconnected from the scripture. But the idea behind the scripture is this, that, that through wisdom came resolution. Through our hero, our super for the day, the wise king, there was a way of cutting through the confusion overcoming the curveball and making sure that evil doesn't triumph in the end. For you and me, we need a super like that in our lives. This king wrote a lot that's preserved in the scriptures. The book of Proverbs is one of those places where we can find wisdom that's meant to lead us through life. Like, for example, this in Proverbs 27.1. Don't brashly announce what you're going to do tomorrow. You don't know the first thing about tomorrow. In other words, try and just stick in today. You know, try and hit that curveball that's coming at you right now. Now, some of the Proverbs, I'll tell you, they're a little more difficult to to connect to our lives, but there's a lot that does. Like this, you can use steel to sharpen steel, and one friend sharpens another. In those times in life when we are really facing challenges, go to a friend. Have a friend help you. When you need to be challenged, a friend will challenge you, but in love. Or maybe this from Solomon. Start with God. The first step in learning is bowing down to God. Only fools thumb their nose, noses at such wisdom and learning. Hmm. For each of us each day, is it possible that if we follow this simple proverb If we start by saying each morning, God, thank you for this morning. Help me to take the next steps in this morning wisely. Where would we be? How would that lead us in the right direction? What if the Proverbs and this wise king, our hero for today, what if he is the conduit for God's spirit to offer you power this week? I think you and I this week will need God's wisdom to lead us through life safely and effectively to overcome evil and participate in God's good. So in order for us to really hear the wisdom of God, I have some suggestions for you this week to think about. What should we do? How do we learn from the wise king? First, ask God to make us wise towards others in order to bless those we love. We're meant to be people who embody the power of the Holy Spirit, and if we are, we should be, out in the world blessing others, just as this wise king sought to receive God's wisdom and discernment, not for his own gain, but to bless others. If we begin this week, each day, even later today, and decide what we're going to do is we are going to begin seeking to be a blessing to others, how will that change our perception of ourselves, of our purposes, of how we interact with other people, of how we live life? 
What would happen if each of us said, I want to be wise towards others in order to bless them and offer them God's love? Second, this week, seek out God's wisdom in the Bible and in those who reflect God's love. So this is two things. First, look at the Bible. Take it in. Look for moments of wisdom. Maybe the book of Proverbs can be a place. Maybe First Kings can be a place where you begin to discover a wisdom that will impact your life positively this week. But then also, get together with other people who reflect that love of God. You know, seek out others. Let those others who also are seeking to live life wisely before God, let them influence you and you influence them. How will you know if someone is wise? Third idea, wise living can be identified. So this week, you and I can look into ourselves and look at others that we are a part of and with and, and, and following, and we can ask ourselves, do these people, do I evidence love? We can say to God. Are we loving? Are we compassionate? Are we visionary? Are we calming? Someone who is living wisely will embody all of these characteristics, evidencing the Spirit of God in them. What does it mean to be loving? It means to offer ourselves to someone else, to be grateful they're part of our lives, and to want to encourage them to discover God's grace for themselves. What does it mean to be compassionate? It means to look at someone else and realize they, like us, are completely dependent upon God. Are, are just as finite and fallible as we, we are. And their circumstance deserves not only God's love and support, but ours too. What does it mean to be visionary? It means to see, I think, that eternity begins now in us. That certainly as we trust in the resurrected Jesus Christ, as we try to understand who God is for us and who we are called to be before God, that we're living each day as if we're already in eternity living faithfully with God. And then why would calming, why would that, that term be a reflection of God's wisdom filling a person? Why would a calming presence reflect wise living? I wanna suggest to you it's because the scripture says one who has turned themselves over to God, who's putting their full trust in Jesus Christ, who allows the spirit of God to live in them and offer power to them, realizes that ultimately God is in control of one's life, helping us through the curveballs of life. And so as we experience people who are trusting in God, who are offering wisdom on God's behalf, we're going to discover those folks calm us down and calm others down too because they are calmer in their spirits. If you tell me you're looking for someone who's wise, I'll tell you here's what you look for. If you tell me you want to be more wise in your life, I'll say, ask God to help you have each of these characteristics and search out those scriptures that bring these life qualities to you. God wants us to learn from this wise king, to live a life of wisdom, because I'm telling you right now, I've never seen a time in our life, in my short life, where there is a, a greater need than now for wisdom. Of course, we probably could say that every single year of our lives. But there's never a better time to turn to God's wisdom and to allow God to change us in order for us to change others too. Will you pray with me? Today, help us, God, to lean on you, to trust in you. Help us to be wise and to find others who are wise to walk with us. In Christ's name, amen.